pancia, silani, yacciami, tati ampi, ambante, tisaranena, sa, pancia, silani, yacciami. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. 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 Buddham saranam gachami. Buddham saranam gachami. Dhammam saranam gachami. Dhammam saranam gachami. Sangham saranam gachami. Sangham saranam gachami. Dutyampi buddham saranam gachami. Dutyampi buddham saranam gachami. Dutyampi dhammang saranam gachami. Dutyampi dhammang saranam gachami. Dutyampi sanghang saranam gachami. Dutyampi sanghang saranam gachami. Tatyampi buddham saranam gachami. Tatyampi buddham saranam gachami. Tatyampi dhammang saranam gachami. Tatyampi dhammang saranam gachami. Tatyampi sangham saranam gachami. Tatyampi sangham saranam gachami. Ti sarana gamanam niti tang. Ama pante. Pana ti pata ve ramani sikhar padang samadhiya. Pana ti pata ve ramani sikhar padang samadhiya me. Adinda dana ve ramani sikhar padang samadhiya. Adinna dana ve ramani sikhar padang samadhiya me. Kami sumi chaha chara vi ramani sikha padam samadhiya. Kami sumi chaha chara vi ramani sikha padam samadhiya mi. Musavata vi ramani sikha padam samadhiya mi. Musavata vi ramani sikha padam samadhiya mi. Sura meraya manja amada thana vera mani sikha padam samadhiya. Sura meraya majja pamada thana vera mani sikha padam samadhiya mi. Imani pancha sikha padani silena sugatingyanti silena bhoga sampada. Sile na nibuting ang titas masilang sodhaye. Sado, sado, sado. Sado, sado, sado. Sado, sado, sado. Page 892, Sutta 110, Chula Punyama Sutta, The Shorter Discourse on the Full Moon Night. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawathi in the eastern part in the palace of Megara's mother. On that occasion, the Uposapa day of the 15th on the full moon night, the Blessed One was seated in the open surrounded by the Sangha of Bhikkhus. Then, surveying the silent Sangha of Bhikkhus, he addressed them thus. Bhikkhus, with an untrue man, nor of an untrue man. This person is an untrue man. No, venerable sir. Good because it is impossible, it cannot be that an untrue man would know of an untrue man. This person is an untrue man. 
but with an untrue man nor of a true man. This person is a true man, nor venerable sir. Good because it is impossible, it cannot be, that an untrue man should know of a true man. This person is a true man. An untrue man is possessed of bad qualities. He associates as a, an untrue man. He will as an untrue man. He counsels as an untrue man. He speaks as an untrue man. He acts as an untrue man. He holds view as an untrue man. And he gives gift as an untrue man. So if I can just um, make a note here. I, I don't think untrue man is probably the best translation. It's strange. I'm not sure what his thinking behind choosing that was. Uh, I, I guess it's not wrong. It's not exactly how we would say things in English. A true man, as he's going to eventually flip it and use the phrase true man, is usually um, just refers to their masculinity more than anything, but obviously that's not what he's referring to here. It's not anything about gender or, or, or being masculine. Um, but the, the the only clue that we have for what this means is the prefix sa. I mean, I mean, in the word itself. Of course, the commentary and even the Buddha explained what he means by sa purisa. And sa purisa... Purisa means man, sa is just a prefix that means good or beautiful or uh, even composed, collected. But the the Buddha's words on it are in regards to wisdom. So according to the Buddha, it's a why it would be a wise man. But of course, sa doesn't literally mean wise, so it might not be any better to translate it that way. But it's more accurate because it's nothing about being true. There's nothing really here about truth or truly being truly human even. Uh, the, probably I would say the best, most literal translation is just good man, like how we say in English, gentleman. Uh, but, but good fellow, I used to translate this as good fellow because that's probably the closest, or I, could, I, I thought it would, was the closest sort of idiom, idiomatic uh, expression that we have. Idiomatic colloquialism, I don't know what it's called, but a good fellow is uh, you know, someone who you should respect is basically the idea here. Dante, can we also understand this translation maybe as someone who's acting according to the truth or untrue? What is untrue? It's just that it's not a translation and it's weird that he uses the word true at all. Unless it has something, you, unless there's some commentarial explanation of it, something to do with the word satcha, but I, I don't understand how that would work here, like a, a man who is devoted to the truth, satcha, satcha purisa, I don't know. I don't think so. It's pretty simple, sat purisa. Sa is just a word that means good. It's a, it's a, it's a positive indicator. So you, when someone is, has a good wisdom, you say sapanya or ha, or Sapanya means, well, actually that's different, it's more like one who has wisdom. But there's Sapanya and Dupanya. Asapurisa uh, is one who is not a Sapurisa. Anyway, I just, I think it's it's odd. And, and if you're not a native English speaker, or even if you are really, this probably comes across a little bit odd because we don't, ever use this phrase true man unless we're referring to their masculinity i think uh i mean i understood it as de la war uh like uh it's like about the true or uh, not true yeah, it's, or something it's not really how we use the word true like a true mm. a, a true uh a true scotsman there's this there's this logical fallacy, the no true Scotsman fallacy, where someone says no Scotsman would do this, and the other person says, oh, but there's this other there's here this man is a Scotsman and he does that, and the guy replies, well, no true Scotsman would do that. It's shifting the goalposts, and they, so they use this example anyway. The the point is, we that's how we use it when we say no true Scotsman. So if you were truly a man. That's what the phrase means in English. 
Satpurusha means uh, a good man, a good person, or somebody mm-hmm. with uh, values, morals. That's literally what it means. I mean, Sat is a very simple prefix that is used like this in a lot of ways. And truth, I don't think, ever comes into play. Or or, or the authentic, authentic, authenticity, like you're not a real man. It's not about that, and that's not what Sat means. Sa, it just usually means good, but it can also mean uh, someone who has, like, yeah, well, that sapanya is actually quite a different word. So it means someone who has wisdom. Five. And how is an untrue man possessed of bad qualities? Here, an untrue man has no faith, no shame, no fear of wrongdoing, is unlearned, lazy, forgetful, and unwise. That is how an untrue man is possessed of bad qualities. And how does an untrue man associate as an untrue man? Here, an untrue man has for, has for friends and companions those recluses and Brahmins who have no faith, no shame, no fear of wrongdoing, who are unlearned, lazy, forgetful, and unwise. That is how an untrue man asso- associates as an untrue man. And how does an untrue man will as an untrue man? Here, an untrue man wills for his own affliction, for the affliction of others, and for the affliction of both. That is how an untrue man wills as an untrue man. And how does an untrue man speak as an untrue man? Here an untrue man speaks false speech, malicious speech, coarse speech, and gossip. That is how an untrue man speaks as an untrue man. And how does an untrue man act as an untrue man? Here an untrue man kills living beings, takes what is not given, and misconducts himself in sensual pleasures. That is how an untrue man acts as an untrue man. How does an untrue man Hold views as an untrue man. Here an untrue man holds such a view as this. There is nothing given, nothing offered, nothing sacrificed. No fruit or result of good or bad and bad actions. No this world, no other world. No mother, no father. No beings who are reborn spontaneously. No good and virtuous recluses and brahmins in, in the world who have re- realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declare this world and the other world. That is how an untrue man holds views as an untrue man. <clears throat> and how does an untrue man give gifts as an untrue man? Here, an untrue man gives a gift carelessly. Gives it not to wish his own hand. Gives it without showing respect. Gives what is to be discarded. Gives it with the view that nothing will come of it. This is how an untrue man gives gifts as an untrue man. That untrue man thus possessed of bad qualities, who thus associates as an untrue man, builds as an untrue man, counsels as an untrue man, speaks as an untrue man, acts as an untrue man, holds views as an untrue man, and gives gifts as an untrue man, on the dissolution of the body, after death, reappears in the destination of untrue men. And that, and what is the destination of untrue men? It is hell, or the animal world. Because what a true man know of a true man, this person is a true man, Yes, Venerable Sir. Good, because it is possible that a true man would know of a true man. This person is a true man. But would a true man know of an untrue man? This person is an untrue man? Yes, Venerable Sir. Good, because it is possible that a true man would know of an untrue man. This person is an untrue man. <clears throat> because a true man is possessed of good qualities. He associates as a true man, he wills as a true man, he counsels as a true man, he speaks as a true man, 
He acts as a true man. He holds views as a true man. And he gives gifts gifts as a true man. Um, but may I ask uh, what is meant by wills? Is it is it like good intention? Yeah, will when you will something, it's in regards to your inclination. Uh, Intention is probably the right word. I maybe I, I prefer inclination. I think is preferable because intention in English we just it, it's vague and can be misleading. But that's the idea. Your inclination, if you might think of it, when you do it and say things. Your inclination is towards your own affliction and the affliction of others. J. Deity. The thing I say, Mante, the Asapur is thoughts, like uh, unwholesome thoughts. Thinks. Yeah, I mean, you could literally translate it as you think, because that's what, if you notice what he's doing here, it's. Um, you have the three, right? Well, you have physical and mental. Physical, verbal, and mental. Sorry, I was looking at the, the giving. There's this strange where he says, uh, gives what is, discar what is to be discarded. Mm -hmm. Sanka, do you have the singhala for that part where he... Yeah, let me, let me look that I think it's actually correct. I just, I think I just didn't quite understand the poly. I think it's okay. You would like throw it away, like discarding something without mm -hmm. respect, like. Well, that's that's uh, my that's what the singhala says. Yeah, like. Uh, uh -huh, that sounds. That's what my question was. Is because it's not giving what we like. It's not giving junk. It's giving without. Uh, giving as though you were throwing it away. Like, oh, here you can. T I've had people give things. Westerners give things to me like that. Oh, here you can have this. And it just just felt really kind of well different from how Thai people give things. It's respectful, like getting rid of a big guy. Here you go. Don't trouble me anymore. Uh, well, I, I was thinking more like the thing you're giving away, like a, giving as though you're throwing it away. So you're, it's about your mind state because, of course, giving is such a wonderful thing that you've just kind of made it null and void by your state of mind of just, hmm, just throwing it away. So that's more what it is rather than, I think here the the implication of his translation is more giving uh, something that is to be thrown away, like the thing and, you uh, give is garbage. May I defend uh, Western people, please? <laughs> so, because uh, it's not, um, we don't, we are not raised in this religion. Like, it's sometimes we don't really know how to behave properly. And then. Most people are fine. I didn't mean to say bad. It's just you wouldn't so much find. Well, if someone who's Buddhist doing that, but uh... I had like anxiety or something to uh, bring food to you because I knew like I could not uh, put both of my hands uh, on the food and give it to you, just the one hand and things like that. So <laughs> it's difficult. Yeah, but like as I was saying, this is the mind state. The person's mind being just going to throw this away. I, I think what's maybe more common than that is uh, sort of, as you say, the worry. But there's just often an awkwardness, like not sure how, not mm -hmm. being sure how to behave. Because I but uh, you know, that's more in a. I wasn't thinking particularly about it as in a religious context. It's just the example I have, but. Um, you know, people give things all the time, and as Sanka said, the idea of the beggar is probably the most familiar. If someone just whatever, take my money, gives them yeah, a quarter or something like that. Is that okay? That like that I don't put too much pressure on myself 
but I'm still like um, considerate and, and thinking of the roles. Yeah, I mean, the roles are not the most important thing. And contact with religious organizations or individuals is always stressful when you're, well, is often stressful when you're an outsider. I was so afraid of everything when I first went to Thailand and went to the monastery in Thailand. Everything was foreign and everything I did was wrong. And one one monk said, don't be afraid. And I said, how can I not be afraid? <laughs> it was everything was, this is wrong and that is wrong. And and, and it, every time I did something wrong, it was, oh, the Westerner, yep, they just can't do anything right. Um, but it's unwholesome. It's, uh, th I think the best you can say about it is it's um, the unavoidable consequence of being uh, subject to or prone to giving rise to things like worry and fear. It's just a bad habit that we have to be afraid. And unfortunately, when you're put in a situation that is unfamiliar, it triggers those unwholesome tendencies. So... I mean, it's, a, if anything, a sign that uh, we really have to apply ourselves to meditation as quickly as possible, or else we're always going to be subject to these situations where we give rise to worry and fear and, well, things like anger and lust and, and you know, all of the many things that, that uh, we will be triggered by. It's, it's kind of unfortunate that it happens in... in uh, association with going to a meditation center because that's what you're going to try to do but it's one of the challenges of doing a, and running a meditation course and it's a reason why we have the uh, part of the reason why we have the opening and closing ceremony the reason why we have the tray where you ask forgiveness of your teacher and your teacher asks forgiveness of you because we realize that this is imperfect and we're going to have to interact with each other and there's going to be awkwardness and misunderstanding and potential resentment. Sometimes meditators have it. And, you know, and, and the obvious fear and worry. Like, how imagine going in front of Ajahn Tong and having to report your practice to someone so well, respected and famous and... If we think in Buddhism that material things are inherently, that possession of material things is inherently wrong and possession is ultimately an illusion, then why is giving such a big virtue? The, the virtue of it actually is the giving up. Uh, you could say that the giving is virtuous. Let's say there's two levels to it. Because I don't think it's just the giving up that could be considered wholesome. But the wholesomeness of giving is, um, with, without thinking about the giving up part, is, um, is wholesome in a worldly sense, in the sense that it leads to harmony, that it leads to states of existence in samsara that are pleasant. So imagine if everyone were taking from each other. Imagine even if we're in relationships, it was all about taking. Well, we don't have to imagine. Some relationships are like this, where it's all about me. What are you doing for me? You're not doing enough for me, 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 me. Uh, and other so, in opposition to relationships that are giving, where it's all about what I can do for you, and then there's one-sided relationships where one person is giving and caring and the other person is controlling or, or is uh, um, taking and just expecting, like a parasite. Uh, and these, two, these different relationships, of course, lead to different results. And so if you uh, engage in giving, if you are... Uh, kind and generous, then you're going to create a, a different result. So in that sense, we call it wholesome. And that doesn't have to do with giving up, per se. It's just giving is the right thing to do. And if you're always giving, 
you're going to have a very pleasant uh, life. Or, or, well, pleasant consequences of that giving. Of course, other bad things you may have done before may lead to still lead to bad consequences. It's not like it's a magic pill where you give and everything turns rosy, but the consequences of the giving will always be positive and, and will always be pleasant. And you could say, furthermore, that those pleasant consequences could be, in some cases, conducive to meditation practice, though honestly, that's that's sketchy because you do often see people who are, are reaping the rewards of their good deeds completely negligent in regards to meditation practice. Why would they practice? Why would they care? Everything's great. Suffering? What's that? Of course, it's it's usually not true, and they are suffering, but they're so enamored with their the results of their good deeds that they... Uh, are blinded by this, blinded to the suffering. But the other, more important from a Buddhist perspective, aspect of giving is the giving up. Um, and, and that doesn't mean throwing away. That means realizing that you are attached to things and cultivating as a practice the the letting go, the giving away as a means of combating or, or uh, counteracting your greed, uh, your miserliness. So, um, Bhante, just, just a question related to that. Like, if um, like I would be attached to something, and but I still decide to give it away, but, you know, the thoughts are still like, <laughs> oh... I, I yeah. still want it. Is it is it okay? Yeah, it's a it's a practice. It's forcing you to confront that wanting because you can no longer have it. It's it, of course immediately that's the question and the thing that came in to my mind as well is that well yes, but it's not vipassana. It's not mindfulness. It's a yeah. good sort of auxiliary practice, and it's not something. It's not a magic pill. It's something that works best as a habit. It's a habit you should remind yourself to get into because it allows you to see the conflict. Okay, I'm going to give. Oh, I don't want to give, and you mm -hmm. see right away the pro the problem. So it's helpful for yeah, yeah. practice of mindfulness in that way. Just related to this, like you shouldn't wait until you don't want that object, right? Like. Right, right. Then okay. it would be kind of like what he's saying here, the, the throwing away. I surprised right. myself yeah. and I gave something um, that I really, really liked away and I felt good about it. But then I realized that I wanted it so much that I went out and got myself another one. So I feel <laughs> like that was unwholesome. <laughs> but it allows you yeah. to see... The, the, the practice of giving allows you to see these things. It allows you to see sometimes, the again, the worry about giving. I once gave, uh, was giving, was a part of giving food to, to monks you know, many, many years ago. And I was so worried about, uh, oh no, I was also kind of annoyed that everyone was very late and kind of worried that we were going to be late or something like that. And then I realized, I said to myself, oh, this isn't going to be wholesome if you're like this. So it, it, it forces, it's a good, a good uh, situation to force you to confront certain mm -hmm. qualities. I mean, I can understand why Buddhists believe that, let's say, giving food to a starving person is noble because you free them, you temporarily free them from suffering because a normal person can't uh, has to suffer if he starves but when you say let's give um, an expensive electronic device or a beautiful flower vase you just um, you just empower the habit of being attached to worldly things, so it's very hard for me to understand how this is not noble. Well, it's what? less noble because of the object. The quality, if you want to talk about giving, the, 
the uh, the factors in giving are the giver, the givee, the, the receiver, and the object. So they're all going to impact the quality of the the, the karma. Thank you. Sixteen. And how is a true man possessed of good qualities? Your true man has faith, shame, and fear of wrongdoing. He's learned, energetic, mindful, and wise. That is how a true man is possessed of good qualities. And how does a true man associate as a true man? Here, a true man has for his friends and companions those recluses and brahmins who have faith, shame, and fear of wrongdoing, who are learned, energetic, mindful, and wise. That is how a true man associates as a true man. And how does a true man will as a true man? Here a true man does not will for his own affliction, for the affliction of others, or for the affliction of both. That is how a true man wills as a true man. 19. And how does a man counsel as a true man? Here a true man does not counsel for his own affliction, for the affliction of others, or for the affliction of both. That is how a true man counsel as a true man. And how does a true man speak as a true man? Here a true man abstains from false speech, from malicious speech, from harsh speech, and from gossip. That is how a true man speaks as a true man. And how does a true man act as a true man? Here a true man abstains from killing living beings, from taking what is not given, and from misconduct and sensual pleasure pleasures. That is how a true man acts as a true man. And how does a true man hold views as a true man? Here a true man holds such a view as this. There is what is given and what is offered and what is sacrificed. There is fruit and result of good and bad actions. There is this world and the other world. There is mother and father. There are beings who are reborn spontaneously. There are good and virtuous recluses and brahmins in the world who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declared this world and the other world. That is how a true man holds views as a true man true man give gifts as a true man that true man thus possessed of good qualities who thus associates as a true man wills as a true man counsels as a true man speaks as a true man acts as a true man holds views as a true man and gives gifts as a true man on the dissolution of the body after death reappears in the destination of true man and what is the destination of true man it is the greatness among the gods, or greatness among human beings. That is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Sadhu. 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 Wonderful Bante. teaching here. Bhante said like, um, like, Throwing something like it's trash, but it, here the opposite is a valuable gift, Pante. So it's like not trash to you, right? No, the, the, opposite. the opposite is just, it's again, he's, he's liberal with the translation. It's just says, as far as I can see, it says the opposite, Anna, it just adds an Anna, which means not as if throwing it away. Uh -huh. I mean, it's not clear from I don't I don't quite understand the Pali, but pita, pita has something to do with throwing away. I think not throwing it away is the idea. Not like not treating it as if he's throwing it away. And the opposite, the first one is uh, throwing it away. He does not give. He gives throwing it away is the idea. I think. Uh -huh. So again, I agree with, I think I'm more inclined towards what Sanka was saying. They sort of singly says, treating it as though not, not, it has nothing to do with the actual gift itself. It's not garbage or what is valuable. 
it's the way you treat it or the way you see it, perceive it kind of thing. And there's nothing to do with valuable. The word valuable doesn't come up. Uh, I think I, I interrupted someone. Was it Ramos? Uh, I want to ask a question before. Sure, thank you. Um, I just want to ask about um, giving a valuable gift. Uh, so in, I was thinking about um, when you share the Dhamma with others. Um, Sometimes uh, when I have talked about it with friends, um, I was uh, mm, afraid that I didn't say the right thing so in a correct way. Um, so if you can uh, give me like uh, an advice of how is the way of sharing the Dhamma, of talking about it when you talk about it with other people? Well, basically be enlightened. Mm. If you're not enlightened, you have to be... Uh, I guess the corollary is if you're not enlightened, be careful. Mm. Don't uh, be too en enthusiastic about it because later on you'll realize you're not as... as uh, well, your words are not as, as helpful as you may have thought. It's just because uh, lately is uh, quite important... Uh, topic to talk maybe is uh, the only one that uh, I want to share or I want to talk with others so this is the reason why I ask I mean the safest way is to pair it to pass on what you've been taught which is why that's what you see what happens that's why we have these suttas right it's all just passing on what the Buddha said and we don't have so much commentary it's mostly just This is what the Buddha said, and that's all. Thank you, Bante. You can Safe. always, sorry, Bante. You can always double check your uh, whatever you say with the uh, the man with air, and you can always uh, uh, check, double check your opinions with uh, learned monks. See whether you are uh, understanding something right. That's true. But it's 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 um well it's still worth being careful and cautious and less inclined to give your own ex explanation being careful because mm -hmm. how will you know which monks are learned how will you know that you're understanding the suttas correctly how do you know your interpretation as we can see it, there's it's easy to have a diversity of interpretations. So yeah, even passing the on is always... Passing on is, in my mind, passing on is usually a good sign, even of someone who's enlightened, because the enlightened one is going to be free from the, um, the ego of passing on their own teachings and of uh, feeling smart. So there go, the humility will lead them much more to pass on the teachings that are already passed on. Like the teachers say this, and the Buddha said this. I mean, most important is the Buddha said this. It shows the humility, it shows reverence, it shows wisdom to defer to the Buddha. It, 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 because it is easy to fall into the ego of thinking that you have the answer and explaining it, explaining your views as opposed to passing on. Ajahn Tong was really good at, at this. It was always what the Buddha said. It was always, and that was my first indication of uh, that. I, I picked up on that when I follow, started following and realizing, yes, this is, this is a, a good way to always just pass on what has been taught. And on your own, of course, it doesn't mean you're just a parrot blindly reciting. Uh, it means that that's what you strive to understand as well. But your understanding is never going to surpass theirs, and your explanations, therefore, are never going to surpass, surpass theirs. What I find is the lack of wisdom is what much more leads you to talk more, say more. <laughs> 
And, and that's unavoidable because it's harder for you to say the right thing exactly that the person needs to hear. So you have to talk more to get the same point across. Thank you, Bante. And, and also maybe not try to talk to people who are not asking questions or something. Or if you don't know the answer to the question, you just say, I don't know. I am going to find out and let you know. I will follow the advice. Thank you very much. I mean, one one thing that practically, one place where we see this work really well is when people pass on a meditation technique. Like we, that's why we use this booklet. The booklet does contain some of my explanations, but the, the important part of the booklet is not those. It's just the passing on of how to do walking, how to do sitting, how to note, uh, how to use the mantra. Uh, it has the five precepts. It talks about being mindful during daily life. Those key principles are the sorts of things you can just pass on, and they don't require uh, interpretation or anything like that. And if that's the best sort of sort of thing that you can pass on is showing someone how to practice. And you shouldn't be afraid of that. And of course, when you're passing on, you have a lot less to be afraid of. You have the confidence. Yeah, this is, as long as I'm remembering it correctly, this is something that comes from people who have, who have been accomplished in it. I'm uh, always, um, like, I'm really, uh, hmm. so when when I know that I have to teach uh, meditation, for example, I I would not feel authentic if I, I didn't practice prior to that. Like, I, I would, I know that the mind is not in a right place. So it's like that. I mean... When you talk about the Dharma, you also have to kind of be in that place for it to be correct and not like breaking from delusion, I guess. For sure, making sure you practice as well. Important. I have noticed that uh, monks who are uh, uh, well. Uh, Worst in Satipatthana or, or experienced in Satipatthana, especially the Mahasi technique, they seem to uh, teach the Dhamma in a sharper way, like their the sermons are sharper than the average monks. Just an observation. What do you mean by sharp? Sharper means like uh, little fluff, they go directly to the point. Uh, and mm -hmm. it gives you a better understanding of the subject uh, they are talking about. Usually, that's the case. Mm -hmm. yeah, if you that read Mahasi Sayadaw's books, they're yeah, exactly. hard to find, compare. Yeah. No my, my friend... But he's very good at telling stories as well, but it's still very pointed and clear. Mm-hmm. My friend was just saying that uh, she was listening to a, to a famous monk and that uh, she was waiting, like, uh, what what will be the teaching? Like, she was waiting to learn something and uh, what will be the Dharma? But it was all jokes and stories. And I was like, I'm sorry, you listened to the wrong monk. <laughs> Mahasi, Mahasi Sayada does actually talk about this in one of his books. He says there's nothing wrong with telling stories, but uh, if your whole he, he mentions about jokes, he's, it was a thing in Burma as well. It was a thing in Thailand. There was a monk. There was a monk. I think he's the abbot of Wat Chom Tong, a monastery now, who had really entertaining talks, and he was okay. He he was really learned in how to give talks, and they were very simple and. I, you could maybe say watered down. I mean, I don't think anything he taught was really all that profound, but it was okay. Some of it was actually Dhamma and, and so on. I think 
not that impressive, but it was impressive how good he was at giving talks and how confident and how people loved him and listened, liked to hear him talk. And he was funny. Um, and and so there are those two aspects to it. Masi Sayada mentions that it's okay to to reach people with stories, but when that's all it is, when it's just jokes or when there is no substance, or more also when you are um, inclining to make people laugh, even that is something we should we should talk about and something that is problematic and so even if you're if you're just thinking okay now i'll tell a joke and make people laugh i don't see how that is wholesome this is what mahasi says like uh it's it's not if you right i kind of went off there that was more my opinion than his i don't think he actually says that when something makes you laugh, you resonate with the message. Yeah, I mean, saying things that make people laugh, I think, is not crossing the line. But if your intention is to make people laugh, I think you've gone over the line. In regards with being a good person, um, it seems so unfair that being a good person doesn't lead you directly to liberation. No? It, I mean, it does lead directly to liberation. That's the whole point. But, I mean, you have to perceive reality correctly. You also have to perceive reality correctly to be liberal. Well, only a good person. That's what a good person does. They perceive reality as it is. If you can't, that's a bad, that's a bad thing. So it's like a moral requirement to see things correctly. Well, if you're not, that's a smirch. That's a stain on your character. So you're not fully a good person. In fact, that's the summary of uh, the Buddha's address, like Sabha Papa Sakrana, don't do evil deeds. Kosala Sapa Sampada. So that's like a simple way of putting it. So do we believe that people in other religions are bad persons, even if they behave morally? Depends on how what they believe in. Like uh, if they have a wrong view, that is wrong. That is not good. But behaving morally is is not the best sign for someone being a good person. Someone can be very lawful, but corrupt, just because you're following, say, all the precepts, doesn't make you a good person. And wrong view think... is something that we often don't associate with goodness, but it is core to what it means to be, a, what, of good, what goodness means, right view. Yeah, for example, you can keep to the five precepts and be stingy like hell, not give up any to anyone. Mean, you can be yeah. uh, lazy, thoughtless, all the things that the Buddha mentions here. Not all I, I, was, I, I was just thinking, like, nowadays, uh, when, like, especially uh, in English, uh, like, many people just many people like the word that oh you're a good man is used often even even if the the person did something wrong like they start a sentence like like oh i know that you're a good man or a good person but you did this and this is just an error or something so i think i think it's like also started to be distorted when when someone uses this term on on someone else. Well, it is it's valuable to acknowledge. It's it's, it's a, apparently a good retro rhetorical tool that when you criticize someone, you should compliment them first mm -hmm. uh, because it prevents it softens the blow, of course, which I think is valuable. 
But it, it, more, more from a Buddhist perspective, it's valuable to acknowledge people's goodness, to not be fixated on, and not identifying them with their their evil. Right? The Buddha said this: you should always remember the good in people, and you can just discard the bad. Also, when you uh, praise the goodness in people, they develop this sense of uh, hiri, uh, being ashamed of doing evil because right. they identify that they are, it's, it's beneath them, this act is beneath them. Yes. Complimenting each other is a, is a valuable thing. So let's say we have a um, Hindu who sincerely wants to help others and he has all the virtues praised by the Buddha but he accepts right view, he believes in soul and and in God. Is he a bad person? Well, it can't really happen like that. Wrong view informs wrong action and wrong speech and wrong livelihood and wrong thought. It can't be dissociated like that. Mm -hmm. Which is why wrong view is so dangerous. Maybe, maybe uh, the misunderstanding in in you, what you're saying is the like when you think like that there is a like a compact person there. There's not. That's a good point. But there are habits, no. Like being kind to others can become a habit. Yes. Correct. I think right view or wrong view will always be like you know like influencing whatever you do uh, by habit. You know that. Yeah, and and what you don't do. It, well, yeah. in the case of this Hindu or someone from another religion, it will prevent them from practicing in ways to improve themselves. Uh, there's the 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 ordinary person's uh, view of what constitutes a good person is far below, say, the Buddha's view of what constitutes a good person, or maybe not fair to say it like that, but the the ideal of what is truly a good person. Our ordinary perceptions are tinged with our own views, or an ordinary person's own views of self. So a good person is someone who takes care of themselves, and it's always going to be highly, highly limited by these notions of self. The, it's going to be completely bereft of any uh, notion of, of non-self. So, I guess so except they, where it comes to altruism, we're all, like a Buddhist is often looked highly upon because of their altruism, their ability to be free from their own needs, their ability to help others without any concern for their own well-being, that sort of thing. That's always impressive, I think. Uh, I just, I just want to ask, like, uh, what do you think um, about, like, um, if someone, let's say, misunderstands the Buddha's teaching and then or even there are, let's say, priests or something, and they teach this to other people. Um, so what do you think uh, the consequences will be? Or There will be a new Buddhist school. <laughs> well, I, I, think I, it's, I think it's beneficial, for sure. Going to be limited, of course. Even if it's uh, not good. What is not good? So I meant, I meant that someone uh, doesn't have right view and doesn't understand correctly the Buddha's teaching, but they are still teaching it to others. Like, let's say well, somebody... it's going to be, it's going to be uh, tainted by their wrong view. I mean, if they parrot exactly what the Buddha taught, then. There won't be a problem, but mm -hmm. their wrong view is going to inform their speech and their actions. 
Uh, yeah, I'm just I'm just asking if if that's uh, like a really bad thing for uh, for a person if they just um, teach whatever they understand and not exactly parroting back. I think that's the safest. It depends on the it depends. Uh, extent. Depends what they actually say. You have to be more specific. Do they say this is the way to? become one with God or so on? Did they say you should end up visualizing God or speaking with God or so on like that? What do they add? Mm -hmm. Did well, they say this is the way to exercise that. any demons that you have in your that are possessing you? Or they say this is the way to get rich and, and or this is the way to go to heaven? I mean, that's not so bad, but it's not mm -hmm. great. Or they, or they can say, you must always attain the jhanas uh, before practicing vipassana. That would be a wrong statement. But that's okay, right? That, that's not that bad. Yeah, it's not that bad. Well, the bad. problem so with can... that one, the problem with that one is usually the the uh, antagonism. It's a different topic. It's the fact that they are being antagonistic towards people who practice differently so if you say to your students no you must first get the jhanas and then do vipassana that's fine but if you say to your students no you can't it is impossible to achieve insight without practicing the jhanas first that's problematic i mean not only is it wrong but it's also antagonistic because the implication is that those other people that are teaching that way are wrong are deluding themselves, etc. But if you tell your students to do it that way, that's not wrong. And if uh, if the such a teacher who is uh, teaching something wrong realizes that he has made a mistake, uh, he should immediately correct that uh, without considering the uh, blowback or loss of reputation. If he is truly a uh, uh, follow of the Buddha. Outside, <clears throat> outside Buddhism, and the, the Buddhism, I think, is the almost the only exception to this. People who strive to be good persons believe in a higher power or higher principle, and yeah. This is very strange, very hard for me to understand because so many, I see so many people around me that have good karma and they have material, a lot of material happiness. And um, if they were in, if they were such a, such good persons in prior lives, it means almost for sure that they believed that they did good things for a spiritual purpose. And it seems so strange that you get material rewards for for your spiritual driving. It, it's not strange because if you read the Dakinavi Banga Sutta, it says if you give a gift even to an animal, you can expect a hundredfold uh, Merit from that, like a, in return. So you don't really have to uh, practice meditation or work, uh, uh, work towards nibbana specifically. You can do good deeds and uh, get a comfortable uh, birth or comfortable experience as a result. That is how karma works. Yeah, but people who, almost always people who do good deeds believe that good goodness is a, is a goal in itself. I mean, they don't do good deeds to get to go to heaven. No, they do. They do. Look at, uh, look at Mara. I mean, he is at the highest, most <laughs> place possible for in the sensual realm. He is... Uh, not doing good deeds for the sake of goodness. He's doing good deeds. He has done good deeds uh, 
to get to the highest uh, level of sensuality. But what about people who are good for the sake of goodness? Don't they deserve something better than material rewards? Well, they do. They do get... Uh, uh, I think we are comparing people who are doing good deeds this life, but living a poor life with that. That is probably due to what uh, uh, the mistakes they have made in a past life or mistakes they have made in this life. So we can't really say, even though you see a person who is very uh, kind and virtuous, uh, struggling in life financially, it could be because of other reasons, say, or maybe due to reasons in a past life. And you, you might see a very corrupt politician or a family of politicians living very luxurious life. It could be because of their uh, past good karma. And also the material things you gain from good deeds, they certainly can support your practice Let's or access to the Dhamma because we wouldn't be here if we didn't have this access to a uh, uh, to this device to anything we we I don't know how to say it but material uh, things are very important for for this reason it's not yeah, that it, to, to take two weeks off and fly to another country and do a meditation course not everyone can do that even if they wanted to Oh, and the well, Deva realm. Well, the Deva realms are, are a little bit easier. They say that many, many, countless Devas became enlightened in the Buddhist time because of how easy it was. And they can meet many Buddhas, right? I don't know about oh. that. There's only one Buddha at a time. Uh, even during one, one Deva's lifetime? Oh, yeah, of course. If uh, you are like a long, you have a long lifespan, you, there might, uh, many Buddhas might appear in the world during your lifespan. There's a Naga, there's a Naga that lives uh, in the river, what is the river name? The river near Bodh Gaya. And every time a Buddha Every time a bodhisattva makes the wish for the bull to to travel up river, the bull falls. Bull travels up river a ways. He says, "Bodhisattva makes a wish, makes a resolve. If I am to become enlightened, make this bull float upstream." And the bull floats upstream. And it floats upstream a ways, and then it sinks, and it sinks down to the realm of this naga, this dragon. That's resting at the bottom of the, I guess, in a hole at the bottom of the river. And clinks against the other bulls. And every time it happens, he wakes up and says, wow, these Buddhas, they just become enlightened every day, it seems. It just keeps happening again and again. Now, I don't know if that's a true story, but that's one of the stories. And also, since the... Since the lifespan of uh, 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 the heavenly realms are very long, I mean, Buddha could appear in the world and uh, attend Parnipana while you are playing with your playmates, and <laughs> you you completely miss the event if you are in one of the highest uh, realms. It's true, for sure. It was so shocking for me to when I discovered the Buddhist vision of heaven because it's so worldly and I always imagined maybe it's also because I used to be a Christian but I always imagined heaven as being a state of heightened spirituality I mean much m more immaterial than this Buddhist text Actually, I mean, from my from my Christian friends, I heard that uh, it's like um, like 
singing and dancing exactly how the how the Buddhists uh, say. I don't know. I there I have a bias. Okay. I mean, he heaven is just the realm that you inhabit. The the experiences you have and so there are different types of experience some are very immaterial and um christians believe that um heaven is union with god is inseparable from god is it possible that the beings in heaven actually imagine they live in this perpetual in this long illusion of being one with a higher reality possible i don't think it's as likely as i don't think it's i don't think so but you know, it's just conjecture i mean the mahabrahma thinks that he created the world and he is controlling everything can be deluded Yeah, about that for sure. Oh, there's certainly many deluded devas, I'm sure. Yeah, even Christians go to heaven, and even Muslims, have, everyone can. <laughs> um, heaven, heaven meaning to, for me, or even the Brahmalayams, like some uh, Hindus go to the Brahmalayams, right, when they meditate and... Uh, attain to the jhanas and so on. So, yeah, not only example, Buddhist. Ascetic Siddhartha's uh, first uh, two teachers, Buddha Karama Putta, Alara Kalama, mm -hmm. they went to Brahma Renaps. The immaterial ones, no less. Yeah. Speaking of uh, giving, the giving arms has uh, five uh, merits the first one is are ah, you long life uh, second one is one which is a uh, nice complexion then the third one is supper is uh, uh, fourth one is bala which is uh, physical strength and fifth one is panya which, which is uh, wisdom so there's also not just the material there's also wisdom as a merit Bala might refer to mental strength as well. Yeah, of course. For forgiving. Oh yeah. Yeah, especially arms food. Yeah, it depends who you are giving to, right? Well, I think giving in general makes you more confident and more content, stronger in mind. Speaking of almsgiving, in paragraph 22, um, he translates uh, what is sacrifice. So I think he, he's talking about giving alms, but this, is, this the, is it a good translation, do you think, Pante? Sacrificing. What is, is that in the reviews part? Yes, it, what's it? One, two. It's in the no, 21. Yeah, 22. 22. Ali is mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they're just synonyms. The sacrifice no, sounds like. Uh, yeah. Know. Giving up something. That's not necessarily giving to someone else. Let me see the Pali. Ati dinang, ati gitang, ati hutang. Yeah, it's funny because these are words that are actually used in the Vedas. The Agni, Agni Hotra. Uh, Hutta is, is what would be given to the fire. So he's using very religious speech. This is a, actually a, a stock passage you'll see elsewhere where the Buddha talks about mundane right view. Uh, and so these are kind of charged words that lead to explanations of what is a true sacrifice, right? And a correction of the 
sacrifice that a Hindu might make that, yeah, when you pour butter into the fire or any belonging into the fire, you're just throwing it away. But a true sacrifice would be giving up. Or it can also be, sometimes he says, giving to the Buddha or that sort of thing, giving to an enlight- to the Sangha, giving to a worthy cause, basically. That's a good sacrifice. So, so it's again just uh, the Buddha making, uh, turning the words like um, how they used to use the words, but he's now using them in the correct correct way, like how they used kama was different, but then he taught it in the other way. Yeah, yeah. Sacrifice is a good one like that. It's mm-hmm. definitely a turning of the word. Okay, yitang, yitang, I think, is a similar word. What is yit? It comes from yeah, yajati, right? Yajati because yan, yan, ya. Ye, yan, what is that? How does it go? Yan, ya. You have in one of the chants. An offering is a yan, ya. Another, another word from the old Ved- Vedas. Um, Bante, um, I'm just, uh, I just want to ask, um, what is heaven for you? Because uh, I came across this, uh, that it's described that in the book, I can't remember what book, it says that heaven is not a place, but it's a state of consciousness. That's not really accurate. It's uh, it's a kind of I mean it sounds good and there are Buddhist teachers who teach that sort of thing but it, it, they don't realize I think that it's similar to saying this body doesn't exist or this room that I'm in doesn't exist that the physical doesn't exist basically heaven is just a a physicality so it is fair to say um, heaven is not a place it's just experience but that's only true in the same way that this room that I'm in is not real. It's only experience. Do you understand? So heaven yeah. is no less real, no less real than this room that I'm in now. But it's also no more real. But those, when someone says that kind of thing, I think they've missed the point or they've fallen into wrong speech and wrong view because they're trying to say that it is less real than uh, than than this uh, realm that I'm in. I don't know. I, I suppose they just have to be a little more careful with their speech, because for all intents and purposes, heaven is as real as this room that I'm in. It is a place. There are gardens. There are trees. There are flowers. There are mansions and wonderful, wonderful sights and sounds and smells and tastes and feelings but it's all still just experience it's not a state of mind that's wrong because this room is not a state of mind right my stomach (laughs) rising is not a state of mind but it's a part of experience the mind that knows the stomach is rising is a part of experience and the stomach rising is a part of experience there are two parts and it's it's kind of reminiscent of this um, common tendency to slip into the simplification of non-dualism. Non-dualism is so tempting. It's so tempting to say it's all just mind, it's all just mind. But it's inaccurate. It's much more accurate to say there are two aspects of experience. We talked about this last week, I think. Yeah, I like, and yeah. to the yes, thank you. Usually, the people who, who say that uh, heaven, heaven, and hells are just uh, uh, mental states are uh, uh, people who have a hard time uh, uh, believing that uh, there's there's something after death. Like they they think that it all ends after death. So they try to put interpret everything in terms of uh, right this life. 
Paticca Samupada as well. They really have a problem with that one. Unfortunate. But, but there's something to experiencing um, heavenly or hellish states in this life. Like people doing a lot of good things have, uh, I could say, not, not to say, I don't want to say they're like in heaven, but there are certainly persons who do so much evil that you could say that it's like being in hell because they, they, they are so miserable and have so many bad experiences. Yeah, and in some sense, that's just uh, an easy way to appreciate the possibility of heaven and the possibility of hell, because you're kind of trivializing both by saying that, because hell is nothing like the experiences that pretty much anybody on earth, no matter how bad it, it may be, has. And the same with heaven. There's nobody on earth who is going to ever experience heaven on earth. Uh, but it's the same sort of idea that you can see how that disparity exists even on earth. The heaven and hell are just magnifications of that, like a thousandfold or even more. There's a one sutta where the Buddha talks about, I think we're coming up on it actually in, in a bit, uh, where the Buddha talks about, they ask, is it possible to give a simile? Is it possible to describe heaven? Oh, it's very difficult. Is it possible there's a simile? Or, or with hell, uh, he, the Buddha says, well, imagine a man was pierced by a thousand spears in the morning. Just pierced a thousand times in the morning, a thousand times during the day, and a thousand times at night. That wouldn't even come close to what it would be like to experience hell. Yeah, even, even if you are a corrupt person, say a politician, if you are really cunning, you can get away with the uh, consequences from, from the law and you can have a nice pension, live a uh, comfortable life, although you might have some mental agony. Still, there's nothing compared to what you would experience after being born in hell. Well, I wouldn't use that as a best comparison. There are people on earth who uh, are tortured or uh, manipulated or extreme drug addict. psychologically. Yeah, I don't know about a drug addict. I'm thinking more of prisoners of war, uh, people who are uh, in imprisoned or kidnapped and brutally tortured, that sort of thing. Some of the stories you hear of things that happen to people. War is probably the best example. Some war experiences that you hear about are just inhuman. Yeah. But there are other examples, ch children who are abused and that sort of thing. I think that when you are in heaven, your ability to experience joy is enhanced. And <clears throat> on the opposite, when you are in hell, your ability to, ex your capacity to experience sorrow. Which sutta did you get that from? No, it was a, a logical deduction from what you said. I don't think that's very accurate. I'm, I, I'm, I don't know. <clears throat> all I keep hearing is like it's all about the person going to hell and a person going to heaven and that's not what it's going to be. Like, there is no person who's going anywhere. It's going to be a different experience and not for you, but just a for the future. consciousness. Yeah, the consciousness, a different consciousness with a different coupling with the different circumstances so it's not going to be you nor here nor there no yeah, but it's, it's neither you nor a different person yeah i mean i don't think you have to go so far as to say it's not you it's not you in the sense that no experience is self but uh, I, I don't know that 
making any statement in that regard is probably probably better to not make statements about it. It's just confusing. Since I'm not rid of conceit, I have a hard time to really uh, think in that way, even though I know what you said is right at it. But, yeah. yeah I mean, it's certainly, not, it's certainly not someone else. Certainly not. Like, if you experience, if you go to hell, I'm not going to experience it. So the, these words are, it's tricky, it's confusing. If you start to say things like that, What's what's best is to focus on the actual experiences. The experiences are not self. Experiences are always yeah. not self. So that's that's what I was trying to say, that it's going to be a different experience. There is no need for you or me or anything. It is not. I mean, each experience is a new experience. When I tell uh, people... When, but you, you have to be able to separate conceptual from ultimate reality because it's you can't just use ultimate reality to talk about these things because you're talking about concepts like a birth or a, a life so this life and the, my next life in heaven or in hell or wherever are concepts but you have to use conceptual language to talk about them and say i am the one who's going to hell and i am the one who's going to heaven not you not somebody else so that's in probably conceptual the safest. way, right? Yes. Yes. All right. But when you start to get into the technical aspects, people fall into trouble when they say, "Hey, the Buddha said you're going to heaven." That means the soul migrates, right? They've they've conflated the two the two yeah. realms: reality, ultimate reality, and conceptual reality. No, the Buddha was talking in conceptual reality. In ultimate reality, Dicca Samuppada. Is the is the is the same as uh, saying that is the person who took refuge at the beginning of the, this sutta, the same person uh, right now listening to this conversation. Same mm -hmm. as that. well, that's an that's an interesting question because it's valuable to see how we are different people from moment to moment, or our mind states are so individual as to help us see that there is no underlying personality. And I tell people that there is no self. They usually ask me to give a definition of the self because it's something that people conceive in so many different ways that the word self almost has no meaning. Well, remember, the Buddha never said there is no self. He said, I don't mean that to say that. I don't mean that to say that. That the Buddha allowed for itself, but the fact that he never said it is a valuable lesson to us. That us saying it can be problematic, just as the Buddha saying it would have been problematic. Not problematic, but problematic in the sense of not helpful. Not that it would be technically wrong, it's just kind of the focus of that statement is problematic. Not the right way of looking at things. Because you're, 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 you're confusing, when you say there is no self, you're kind of, in that statement, conflating two realities. It's not really wrong to say it, but it's problematic because there is, is talking about things, and things are conceptual. There is no self is saying that in the conceptual realm, the self is not a thing that exists. You might even be able to argue that in the conceptual realm, the self is a thing that exists. And I mean that just in terms of, as I said, my experiences are not your experiences. And so conceptually, I exist. But it's only conceptually. In ultimate reality, I mean, truly what really exists is just moments of experience. And those moments of experience are impermanent suffering and non-self. Yeah, and that's um, why you, you can't be too... It's It's problematic to be too vocal or to put into words these things because it's confusing, it can be misleading, and it can be wrong. I mean, inaccurate, I suppose. It can be. And, and also who never meditated or experienced this like a momentary sure. thing, they will not understand a word For of sure. it. They would just be more confused. The Buddha even said that. He would have just been more confused if I had said that. But Buddha did say that all dhammas are not self. 
Yes. Meaning to aggregate. And the Not just the aggregate. And Nibbana. Uh, is it the, the, the same as saying that there is no self? No, I just explained why it's not. So, what do you mean, Bhante, by not just the aggregates? I, I, I think uh, I don't. Nibbana is also not so. Oh. I so think that's... Frank. <laughs> you, can, you can simply say if something is not under your control, how is it you, you or you us? You can explain like that. Instead of saying there's no cell, something is not born according to your uh, wishes, something doesn't sorry. behave according to your wishes. Okay, I already tried that from my experience. <laughs> sometimes better to just uh, not even mention it because it can reaffirm this belief so people so think about it more. The, cor the correct way you'll see that the Buddha used is um, you stamp out their views. You, you point out that the views are the problem. And this is why the Buddha often just used the word view in, in place of wrong view, because views are always going to be the problem. If you have a view, there is no self, that's usually problematic. It's, uh, it's a view, it's a, it's a conceiving. And so the way you go about it, yes, just teach them meditation, don't worry about it, but be clear in what you say to them, that these views of self, these perceptions of self, taking this as self, taking that as self, this is me, this is mine, all of that is the problem, and you should just let it go. Because there's always going to, until they let go of those views, or until they let go of making views, the, the uh, inclination towards making views and conceiving of things, they're always going to question, well, if it's not me doing this, then who's doing it kind of thing. Their whole frame of reference is wrong. So the solution is just to point out the views, uh, just something they should let go. Because we're not here trying to make a new view. Our view is just this is suffering, this is the cause of suffering, this is the cessation of suffering, and this is the path that leads to the cessation of suffering. You see how... That conveniently has nothing to do with self or soul or not self or not soul. I don't know if I'm allowed to mention another sutta. But it's interesting that in the non-self sutta, Buddha described only the five aggregates as being no self. Yes. So it's interesting that he didn't... Uh, mentioned the fact that all reality is not self. Maybe well, the he five won't... aggregates are all are all reality that you can experience unless you reach nibbana. Yeah, maybe he wanted to focus on the actual experience of his disciples, not on Well he can't he can't have them observe Nibbana as being not self. They're not enlightened yet. There's an interesting um, corollary to that line of thinking. There's a group in Thailand that put out a pamphlet saying that Nibbana is self. Um, and, you know, it, yeah, and there was a very famous monk who wrote an article, a book booklet, I think, uh, a paper, let's say, on why they were wrong. That was a really well-written paper. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know that it's ever been translated into English. We talked about this a long time ago. Maybe someone found the English translation. I think there may be an English translation now that I think of it. But um, a really well written and and uh, very scholarly. Maybe a little too scholarly, but 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 very good nonetheless. And uh, their their um, reasoning comes from. Um, the sutta, the I'm sorry, the passage that um, sabed sankara anijati yada panyaya pasati atani bindati duke esamago visutya sabed sankara duka dukati yada panyaya pasati atani bindati duke esamago visutya sabed dhamma anatati yada panyaya pasati atani bindati duke esamago visutya. So when one sees 
impermanent uh, the five, when one sees all formations are impermanent when one sees all formations are dukkha when one sees all forma all dhammas are not self with wisdom and becomes disenchanted with suffering this is the path to purification and the commentary says that the dhamma here refers only to the Tibumi, the three realms, not the fourth Bhumi, not Nibbana. It only refers to the sensual sphere, the uh, material sphere, and the immaterial sphere, the two Brahma spheres. It does not refer to Nibbana. And they look at that and they said, aha, so that means Nibbana is, is not non-self, it's excluded, and therefore it's self. And so a part of the beginning part of his uh, paper is explaining how wrong that is, and that in other places the Buddha has, in, or the commentary does say it refers to Nibbana. There's another, there's another place where these three things are quoted, Sabbe Sankara Nata, Anicca Sabbe Sankara Dukkha Sabbe Dhamma Nata, and it, and it is referring to all four. It's just that there he wasn't referring to it because uh, you can't you can't see with uh, with wisdom, and become uh, become disillusioned, disenchanted with suffering, taking nibbana as the object. This is before the realization of nibbana. So practically, it's it's irrelevant or it's it's useless. It's just that theoretically it's true, but practically you can't say this is the path to purification because nibbana is not. The, um, well, I don't know if that's quite fair to say, but uh, practically speaking, you 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 don't. This is referring to to vipassana before the realization of nibbana. Would we go back a little bit to what we were discussing earlier? Uh, we were praising the Mahasi Sayadaw books. Um, do you guys see any danger in reading those books, because um, uh, yeah, I see huge danger. Did you say danger in reading danger, those yeah. kind of books? Yes, because, I mean, just the, um, um, like, just promoting, like, um, not, not promoting, but uh, just often one might read many of those and get, like, really strong sense of being a meditator trying to okay. achieve a goal right right uh, i mean it's I don't know. whenever i read his books they just they just incline me towards meditation I yeah yeah but a good sign. but 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 um, but always mentioning you know the meditator always mentioning um, progress of insight always mentioning just a sense of trying to achieve instead of just looking, you know. I never got the sense that it was about trying to achieve. I mean, you're not going to get a positive from me personally because I'll praise his books to the end of the earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, what's wrong with what's wrong with trying to achieve a goal? Isn't that what? Yeah, yeah because uh, because uh, because then you're trying to move from this point to another point, and right. To it can be problematic. Yeah, there's it wrong with it. There's something wrong with it. There's sure. something wrong with trying to move. Like now, now I'm greedy. Now I'm. You should be focused on the present. Yes, the creed and the fear, whatever. But I don't think Mahasi Sayada uh, encourages that. I mean, he's pretty clear about staying focused on the present. But I mean, when when it, when you're teaching. To people, bringing up the goal, the, the the benefits, and encouraging them, inspiring confidence based on the benefits, I think is valuable. Even as a meditator, to reflect on why you're doing things is going to be, let's say, inevitable uh, for the reassurance. It's just that you do have to. It is important to caution meditators not to focus on the goal. Because when you're focusing on the goal, you're not focusing on the present. And it can lead to doubt and worry. Am I there yet? Am I getting there? 
one problem with some of it, with like say the Manual of Insight, referring to yeah, Ajahn yeah. Hong would not let people read this stuff before they mm-hmm. finished the. He he was even stronger. He said, "If you read this, it will block you from Absolutely. from getting results." I mean, I think he was maybe a bit of a hyperbole there, but I stand by. You know, he said it, and he's the teacher. He's my teacher, so I'm not going to criticize him. It may have but, not. You, I wouldn't take that statement. Like oh, oops! I read it. Now I'm, I'm. Mm-hmm. It's impossible for me. But you should certainly take that his words and don't take them lightly. If you haven't mm-hmm. done, you know, basic course in meditation and you've read that booklet, you better be able to put it aside because otherwise. But is there is there ever time. is there ever is there ever a good time to read it? What do you think? Yeah, after you've done at least, I mean, probably I would say. A couple of courses, not just. That sounds like that sounds like kind of self deception. Like uh, now I'm enlightened enough to read it, you know. No, you're you're enlightened enough to uh, be able to separate uh, theory from practice, or be able to 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 uh, avoid the pitfalls of "Am I there yet? Is this it?" Because you've already experienced it, you already know what to expect, so you're not going to be distracted by false paths or or over intellectualizing. You're going to wrestle with it. Once you learn about the say the stages of insight, there's going to be a wrestling. Am I? Is it going to come? Is it real? Am I there yet? There's going to be some of that, but you should be better able to note those worries and doubts and so on. It's still going to be a hindrance. So there certainly is the validity to that. You don't ever have to learn about the statement or read about them anyway. And you should be care. You should appreciate that once you do learn about them, there's going to be some challenges. Besides the actual insights that are enumerated there, I think especially the first part of the book is still the uh, Like anyone could read it, the purification sure. and yeah. the so it's not all the book, I think. But you're right. Like I think, I think I was very, very fortunate that I haven't read it. But it never let me. <laughs> so. But you have the book. Um, I mean, the yeah. irony, irony, irony is that I made you get the book, right? You helped. No, like almost forced. Yeah, that that's the part that he was referring to. Ajahn Dong didn't know about the Manual of Insight, but they have a, a version of it translated into Thai, and or maybe he did know about it. I shouldn't say that, but certainly didn't. The English translation came much later, but I think they may have had it in Thai anyway. He he knew about all of this. And they, yeah, they wouldn't let people read it. Now it's apparently on the internet. You can read all this information. Yeah. You can download it for free. I was teaching um, these students how the, the trainees how to do the reporting, and I was going over this with them. And I said, "This isn't. In, I, we don't really share it. We don't want to publish it or 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 make it publicly available for these reasons." And they said, "Oh, it's on. I think this is it on this website." I thought <laughs> so. There's a website out there that has all this information free for public consumption, which I was I was reprimanded for making a photocopy of it for a nun, which was kind of ridiculous because she was uh, Ajahn Tong wasn't the one who reprimanded me, but one of the monks said, uh, you know, this I don't even have a he said I don't even have a copy of it. You, you got a copy, so you keep it to yourself and uh, don't ever make a photocopy of it. That's how. Kind of how guard, closely it was guarded. I think that was a bit of an overreaction, personally. But it's uh, it's quite different the way people look at these things. To just answer Timu's question, like, is it ever a time you can? I think there is a time when you are safe to read it. The the insight part. I just you know? I just I just feel like when you're ready to read it, you would never read it. That's what I'm well, saying. It can be very helpful for teaching, and honestly, I think that's what yeah. the materials. Like, remember the 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 progress that the Visuddhimagga Kata, this booklet that Mohasisayada did 
share with public. And that booklet has, or that treatise has been revered by his followers because, uh, you know, it's a poly text. But at the beginning of it, he says, this is for people, this is for, I think, teachers, he maybe says, or at least for people who have gained uh, good progress in practice. But then, then at the end, he says, you know, honestly, this, or he says, basically, you know, this, this may actually be a benefit to newcomers as well. But if you read that treatise, it's actually very light on details. Did, did you read it, to, read it to me? Yep, yep. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that part is really only for people who are teaching, and you should read it if you're uh, undergoing training in teaching, which is why they have they have this thing, this this version of it called Vijha Kru, which means Kru is guru, the teacher, basically. Vijha means uh, study, so it's the manual for someone, a teacher's manual that they give out to monks who are undertaking I think they give it out at the end of the training. So a person like uh, who I did take the training from Ubante and also read this, uh, the insights that are, are described by uh, Mahasi Sayada, I can say, like, there is none of it like that um, that's very useful uh, for a teacher or for, for an instructor because it's not like an experiential description, uh, but it's it's more like conceptual, I think. And and uh, how I was trained is more focused on on the experience itself, like momentary experience, and uh, so that's not in it at all. Hmm. So it's a different. I guess it's a different text, but there is a text that was passed on from the Burmese and and also maybe sort of modified or expanded or changed in Thailand. But there is a version that has all of the different uh, practical Fine. characteristics of the signs of, of the stages of knowledge. Uh -huh. Like things, yeah, simple things like feeling a lot of pain or no, it's not in maybe it's not in the manual of insight. Not there. It's, on, it's online, though. There's the online. It goes through each one and tells you the sorts of things you'll experience. It's just that should not be it for public consumption. Can't hide anything from Google. Can't <laughs> see there are a couple of sites. Problem is the mind is is uh, insati insatiable, and even just knowing about it, people are probably now thinking, "Oh, I better find Google this and find it." Yeah, it be okay for me. It's the forbidden fruit. <laughs> Maybe I the can unknown. Add. I don't know it. I better. I better go find it, and so I can know it. Maybe because uh, even though I practiced uh, for some courses, after I read it, there was a huge challenge for me to not keep comparing my experiences to what I read. And uh, as That's you true. mentioned, Bante, yes, as you mentioned, Bante, I had to wrestle a lot with that. And to, uh -huh to car keep it down <laughs> but eventually mm -hmm. i think yeah eventually it's settled but even for people with some experience it can be a challenge so i wouldn't recommend it at all for someone who didn't put a lot of time into practice yeah generally the be the less you read to an extent the less you read before you start practicing the better we have a bit of a new situation here where people are doing the at-home course because this is something we've kind of created that's different from the way I was trained. And so during the at-home course, you have a lot of time to do things like reading. And so there is some reading that could be done, but the stages of insight shouldn't be a part of that. Also, I want to defend the other books of Mahasi Sayada. So those other books that I've read, the uh, they are harmless. Yeah. Valuable. Perfect for reading. Um, so Mahasi Sayada wrote about all the stages of insight. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't know that. Okay. No, no, no comment. Okay. Read his books about the suttas. They're, they're more helpful for 
they're very yeah. healthy. Even his books about vipassana, really anything except for the couple of things. I mean, we have had people who've read them, obviously, and I haven't seen them being blocked like completely. It just they wrestle with it a little bit less. The problem is, see, if you've re read, say, these things we're talking about, and you haven't been meditating, your your remembrance of them is going to be so conceptual that what we see is that they're actually pretty quick to just forget about all that. But they do have yeah. to come to that point where they say, oh, this is nothing like what I thought. So I'll just forget about all what I thought. It's not that bad because of that, because they're not really able to assimilate the two. Yeah, I was. I always thought that uh, if someone didn't see it for themselves, they will forget about it. But I guess I'm. I mean, I'm. This is a question. Like, can you just intellectually repeat to yourself so much that you do remember when it's time for you to see it before? No, the. No, Good, but that's generally not what happens. People just forget about it, and they, they do have to wrestle with it. I think I was wondering is if okay. Mahasi Sado wrote about these stages, that means he went through all of them, and that means he was enlightened, no? Well, not you have to understand only. that it, these aren't from Mahasi Sayada. He's mostly just repeating what's in the Visuddhimagga or simplifying it in some cases, uh, ex ex clarifying it in some places. But these are all in the Visuddhimagga. That's where you find... Take the Visuddhinyana Kata, this, this brief treatise in Pali. You probably get the same... You get pretty much everything that's in there from the, from the Visuddhimagga. It's basically what the Visuddhimagga says about them. So the author of Visuddhimagga was enlightened and wrote about these stages from his own experience, no? But I don't, I mean, that doesn't really have any bearing on it because it's just passing on. Someone experienced these and became enlightened. I mean, the Buddha ex described these uh, stages and the people who practiced according to the Buddha's teaching uh, achieved the same result. And that we would say is happening all the way to the present day but it doesn't really have anything to do with people authoring them i mean maybe it does it would it, it would be a bit weird for someone to write a treatise explaining about them if they haven't experienced them but that sort of thing perhaps does happen mm -hmm. i guess the answer to your question simply is yes of course and you don't have to be enlightened to experience them. I mean, not all of them, I guess. That's also true. Not all of them. And also, when a monk who is not enlightened can technically give advice to or give a sermon to others and the people who are listening can get enlightened. So, I mean, you can't be certain. Yeah, the, like, it's just a separate question if we ask, was Mahasi Sayada enlightened? It doesn't really have to do with him writing the booklet or the books that he wrote. It's just, it's just a valid question. Was he enlightened? Well, I don't think anybody knows except for him. But uh, there's, there's good indications. With Bod Buddha Gosa, uh, it's, it's also... It's maybe even less relevant than with Mahasi Sayada because one of the great things about the commentaries and the Visuddhimagga is Buddha Gosa's seeming um, disinclination towards expressing his own views. Someone was wrote a paper on this so, some years back, pointing that out, saying there's only like one spot where he says, This is my opinion. And everywhere else it's um, these are what the old teachers say, or this is what some people say, and this is what they they counteract this with. But it seems to all have been coming from an earlier source. And so a great thing about his texts is, is that he's uh, compiled them and passed them on and organized them in a really great manner, rather than Buddha Gosa is the teacher uh, who taught the Visuddhimagga. 
it's not really the case. And also, it's not just the. We shouldn't think that it's just the coming from the world with the Gosa because when he uh, uh, compiled the Pisuti Banka, it was approved by the Mahavihara because uh, the monks there. That's true. He was. That was the only way they would let him compile the commentaries, as if he wrote the Visuddhi Manga. Twice. And he, three times. Three times? Yeah. Oh. After the, he wrote it twice, and the day was, he wrote it once, the day was, stole it. He wrote it again, yeah. the day was, stole it again. He wrote it a third oh, time, and as soon as he finished, the other two versions appeared, and they were word for word identical apparently mm -hmm. now that yeah. might be an embellishment of the story but that's the story but why did the devas stole the previous copy why did they so break that the they could idea? so so that they could they didn't steal it they they hid it because they gave them back they never had an intention to take it for themselves but the point was to uh to show his his uh Excellence to show that he could do it three times and have it be word for word identical. From what I've read of the Pipitaka and the Visuddhimanga, never stated clearly that um, Nibbana means uh, annihilation or the total cessation of consciousness and i wonder why didn't if nibbana means that why didn't they just say it clearly consciousness is not something you can annihilate it arises and ceases momentarily it gets annihilated right after it arises so if you said that you would probably be wrong not just confusing so at the moment of Nibbana, isn't consciousness permanently, it, doesn't it cease permanently to, um, all right, doesn't it cease permanently? Everything that arises ceases permanently as soon as it has arisen. I mean, doesn't it cease without future arising? Well, nothing that arose in the past will arise in the future. So also probably still incorrect, but that's basically how the Buddha put it. There is no future arising. Sounds a little bit creepy. I think the Pali word is Banga. Upada Titi Banga. Banga. Gone forever. Vaya also. Yeah. Yeah. You only have to understand it's no longer part of samsara. That's it. Leaving samsara. So you mentioned earlier that in the Buddha's time, many devas got enlightened because it was very easy for them. Mm -hmm. And how, how that happened, I mean... When Buddha went to the Devas realm to um, to present the teachings, or when Buddha presented the teachings here on the earth, and Devas would attend. Both, yeah. Okay. Thank you. You were na parang itayati pajanati. No, no, that's not it. He does say there was no further arising. Basically how he puts it. Oh, a lot of people today. Well, thank you all for yeah. coming. Appreciate the keen interest in the Buddha's teaching. So groups like this, is, we're not unique, of course, but this is uh, the kind of thing that is good to see in the world. Groups of people getting together to expand their knowledge of the Buddhist teaching. I have to go. Thank you all for coming. Wish you all the best. Have a good week. Thank you, Mother. Thank you, Mother. Wish everyone a good week. Bye. Thank you. Have a good week.